wrong for a hostess. A snipper, a pruner, that's more your line. He pointed to a figure in purple who was sawing a dead branch from an apple tree. How about her, he said. You like her at all? Gosh, she said, and she blushed and became humble. That, that puts me right next to Dr. Hitz. That upsets you, he said. Good gravy, no, she said. It's, it's just such an honor. Ah, you admire him, eh, he said. Who doesn't admire him, she said, worshipping the portrait of Dr. Hitz. It was a portrait of a tanned, white-haired, omnipotent Zeus, 240 years old. Who doesn't admire him, she said again. He was responsible for setting up the very first gas chamber in Chicago. Nothing would please me more, said the painter, than to put you next to him for all time. Sawing off a limb, that strikes you as appropriate? That is kind of like what I do, she said. She was demure about what she did. What she did was make people comfortable while she killed them. And while Leora Duncan was posing for her portrait, into the waiting room bounded Dr. Hitz himself. He was seven feet tall, and he boomed with importance, accomplishments, and the joy of living. Well, Miss Duncan, Miss Duncan, he said, and he made a joke. What are you doing here? This isn't where the people leave. This is where they come in. We're going to be in the same picture together, she said shyly. Good, said Dr. Hitz heartily. And say, isn't that some picture? I sure am honored to be in it with you, she said. Let me tell you, he said, I'm honored to be in it with you. Without women like you, this wonderful world we've got wouldn't be possible. He saluted her and moved towards the door that led to the delivery rooms. Guess what was just born, he said. I can't, she said. Triplets, he said. Triplets, she said. She was exclaiming over the legal implications of triplets. The law said that no newborn child could survive unless the parents of the child could find someone who would volunteer to die. Triplets, if they were all to live, called for three volunteers. Did the parents have three volunteers? said Leora Duncan. Last I heard, said Dr. Hitz, they had one, and were trying to scrape another two up. I don't think they made it, she said. Nobody made three appointments with us. Nothing but singles going through today, unless somebody called in after I left. What's the name? Wailing, said the waiting father, sitting up, red-eyed and frowsy. Edward K. Wailing, Jr. is the name of the happy father-to-be. He raised his right hand, looked at a spot on the wall, gave a hoarsely wretched chuckle. <laughs> Present, he said. Oh, Mr. Wailing, said Dr. Hitz. I didn't see you. The Invisible Man, said Wailing. They just phoned me that your triplets have been born, said Dr. Hitz. They're all fine, and so is the mother. I'm on my way in to see them now. Hooray, said Wailing emptily. You don't sound very happy, said Dr. Hitz. What man in my shoes wouldn't be happy, said Wailing. He gestured with his hands to symbolize carefree simplicity. All I have to do is pick out which one of the triplets is going to live, then deliver my material grandfather to the happy hooligan and come back here with a receipt. Dr. Hitz became rather severe with Wailing, towered over him. You don't believe in population control, Mr. Wailing, he said. I think it's perfectly keen, said Wailing tautly. Would you like to go back to the good old days when the population of the earth was 20 billion, about to become 40 billion, then 80 billion, then 160 billion? Do you know what a druplet is, Mr. Whaling? said Dr. Hitz. Nope, said Whaling sulkily. A druplet, Mr. Whaling, is one of the little knobs, one of the little pulpy grains of a blackberry, said Dr. Hitz. Without population control, human beings would now be packed on the surface of this old planet like druplets on a blackberry. Think of it. Wailing continued to stare at the same spot on the wall. In the year 2000, said Dr. Hitz, before scientists stepped in and laid down the law, there wasn't even enough drinking water to go around, and nothing to eat but seaweed, and still people insisted on their right to reproduce like jackrabbits, and their right, if possible, to live forever. I want those kids, said Wailing quietly. I want all three of them. Of course you do, said Dr. Hitz. That's only human. I don't want my grandfather to die either, said Wailing. 
Nobody's really happy about taking a close relative to the cat box, said Dr. Hitz gently, sympathetically. I wish people wouldn't call it that, said Leora Duncan. What? said Dr. Hitz. I wish people wouldn't call it the cat box and things like that, she said. It gives people the wrong impression. You're absolutely right, said Dr. Hitz. Forgive me, he corrected himself, gave the municipal gas chambers their official title, a title no one ever used in conversation. I should have said ethical suicide studios, he said. That sounds so much better, said Leora Duncan. This child of yours, whichever one you decide to keep, Mr. Whaling, said Dr. Hitz, he or she is going to live on a happy, roomy, clean, rich planet thanks to population control. In a garden like that mural there, he shook his head. Two centuries ago, when I was a young man, it was a hell that nobody thought could last another twenty years. Now centuries of peace and plenty stretch before us as far as the imagination cares to travel. He smiled luminously. The smile faded as he saw that Whaling had just drawn a revolver. Whaling shot Dr. Hitz dead. There's room for one, a great big one, he said. And then he shot Leora Duncan. It's only death, he said to her as she fell. There, room for two. And then he shot himself, making room for all three of his children. Nobody came running. Nobody seemingly heard the shots. The painter sat on the top of his stepladder, looking down reflectively on the sorry scene. The painter pondered the mournful puzzle of life demanding to be born, and once born demanding to be fruitful, to multiply and to live as long as possible, to do all that on a very small planet that would have to last forever. All the answers that the painter could think of were grim even grimmer, surely, than a cat box, a happy hooligan, an easy go. He thought of war, he thought of plague, he thought of starvation. He knew that he would never paint again. He let his paintbrush fall to the drop cloths below, and then he decided he had had about enough of life in the happy garden of life, too, and he came slowly down from the ladder. He took Whaling's pistol, really intending to shoot himself, but he didn't have the nerve. And then he saw the telephone booth in the corner of the room. He went to it, dialed the well-remembered number, 2 b r not 2 b Federal Bureau of Termination, said the very warm voice of a hostess. How soon could I get an appointment, he asked, speaking very carefully. We could probably fit you in late this afternoon, sir, she said. It might even be earlier, if we get a cancellation. All right, said the painter. Fit me in, if you please. And he gave her his name, spelling it out. Thank you, sir, said the hostess. Your city thanks you, your country thanks you, your planet thanks you, but the deepest thanks of all is from future generations. The End of To Be Are Not To Be by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. Read by Brian Hoos April 2008